All right, so um, I'll be giving our last talk for the day. Uh, my name is Blair. I'm a postdoc here at Karma, and um, I'm also overseeing um, the research of the Music Engagement Research Initiative this year while Jonathan Berger is on leave. So um, today I'll be talking about a few of our projects relating to engagement in the brain. So I think we've seen today so far that musical or engagement in general can mean many things. Um, we're interested in musical engagement in particular, and so um, in addition to the definition that you've seen twice today, um, there are several other definitions of engagement. So I think what we've been talking about so far is the state of focused attention on music that we can index, for example, using brain responses. Um, but music can mean other things as well. So you could think about engaging with music as a composer or a performer or a listener. Um, you can think about using music to achieve other aims. So maybe you use that to influence the behavior of a shopper, for example. Um, you can think of music as a framework for movement, such as dance. Uh, music is a great vehicle for socialization and shared experiences, so bringing people together in a musical setting. Um, you can also think about um, something I think a lot of us do, which is to engage music as background for other activities. And finally, um, and I think very importantly, um, music can be a badge of identity and a way that you express who you are and how you tell other people who you are. So um, in today's talk, I'm going to be focusing on the first definition, so the state of focused attention, and talking about using the approach that Jacek introduced in his talk with the intersubject correlation now in the context of music listening. So what we saw in the first talk was that um, the ISC is related um, in the video viewing scenario to narrative devices such as tension or suspense. So if we think about this in music, um, our first question would be, would this even work for music? Um, does music contain devices um, that drive reliable responses across listeners? And can we measure those with EEG? And if yes, uh, what exactly are the attributes of music that are driving engagement? And how can we use music and manipulate music in order to investigate this in an experimental setting? So um, I'm going to be talking about three of the experiments that our group is working on right now on musical engagement. Um, all from different genres. So our first experiment is our take on popular music. So this is music that is really good at engaging a large audience. It's very easy to grasp. Um, it should be immediately engaging on first listen. After that, we'll move to classical music. So this is a more sophisticated style of music, some might argue. Um, maybe there's more expression in the music. And um, structurally as well, we'll be looking at a piece that has a very clear buildup um, to what we call a structural high point in the music. And then from there, we'll deviate completely into a third genre called minimalist music, which also has changes in sound over time, but uses a completely different framework um, in setting up audience expectations and actually carrying out um, development of music over time. So um, just to recap um, from Yadzek's talk, what we're talking about when we talk about ISCs. Essentially, um, for the experiments I'll be presenting today, we have a collection of musical examples. We'll play them to um, a set of human listeners. Those listeners will produce um, basically matrices of EEG data. So we have several electrodes, and then we record a time series from each electrode. We'll use the component decomposition technique called RCA, or Reliable Components Analysis. And this lets us um, basically transform our matrices into a collection of vectors. And these vectors are what we will be correlating in order to come out with the ISC. And so the main premise of this analysis um, is that ISC is the index of engagement. And so an engaged audience will have a higher ISC, as computed in this fashion. So for our first experiment, um, we just wanted to validate the approach because it was possible that this just would not work at all. And so what we wanted to do is um, we wanted to find some songs that had successfully engaged a massive audience, but for experimental control reasons, we wanted them to be novel. So to do this, we chose um, a set of Hindi pop songs. Um, if anyone's familiar with the song or these movies, you can 
you'll hopefully agree with that these were popular. Um, so popular yet novel. Um, and then what we're going to do is we're going to take these songs and then we're going to manipulate them in various ways. We're going to disrupt them in time and see what the effect of those manipulations is um, on the proportion of statistically significant ISC over the course of the song. All right, so we have this stimulus set. Um, we selected four songs and then we created four versions of each song. So in total we have 16 stimuli. So our four conditions, um, and these are entire songs by the way, so each song is about four and a half minutes long. So you could hear a song intact, so that's original, just from start to finish. You could also hear the entire song backwards, so from the end to the beginning. Um, we have a third condition where um, we use some beat tracking software to cut the song up into measures and we shuffle those. And then finally, um, our fourth condition is the most disruptive. And so in this one, uh, you can think of it as retaining the overall pitch content of the song, but we're scrambling the temporal organization completely. So this is our phase scrambling version. And if you're curious to how we did this, we literally took the FFT of the song and randomized the phases and went back to the time domain. So I'm gonna play you examples from one of the songs. So first, here's the original. <laughs> onto things like beat and meter and melody and repetition. So here is um, the reverse version of what you just heard. but maybe it's a bit harder to form predictions about where that melody is going. So third is an example just from the measure shuffle version of the song. Alright, and finally the phase scramble version. Imagine how fun that is to listen to for four and a half minutes. <laughs> so, um, so we collected data and we, we also made sure that our participants um, did not speak Hindi or have any exposure to the genre so that there wasn't an impact of um, language comprehension with these manipulations. And um, after analyzing the data, um, first we can look at the topography of the, com the component. So, when we compute reliable components over all of the data, we get this topography, which is different from the film viewing topography, but actually fairly consistent um, with other types of component analyses during music listening. So this was encouraging. And um, as we also had four conditions and we had everyone listen to their songs twice, we can do um, separate RCA computations by stimulus condition and listen. So here we have in the top row is the first listen, and the bottom row is the second listen, and then from left to right we have the original <coughs> reversed measure scrambled and measure shuffled and phase scrambled. And you can see here that actually all three of the conditions that I would call broadly musical are producing this consistent topography um, with each other and also across listens, whereas that phase scrambled control um, is neither consistent with the other condition uh, nor with itself across listens. So from there, we can compute our ISC over time. So let's start at the bottom. Um, this is probably no surprise that the phase scramble stimulus um, produced the lowest ISC. So um, very little of that was statistically significant. After that, um, next was the reversed. So this had 20% of our time windows 
were significant. And then in second place, actually was the original stimulus. So this was the intact musical excerpt, which um, in behavioral ratings, our participants actually favored the most. And somewhat surprisingly, um, it was the measure shuffle condition that produced the most reliable brain response um, in our listeners. And I think this might go back to what Doug was saying about shiny things. So, um, you know, the measure shuffle sounded like music, but it was always something new. Um, so that might be part of what's going on here. And, and I think Doug brought up a really good point about, you know, that's great in, in the first listen, but is that something that you would really want to engage with? Um, over a long period of time. So I think that would be something that would be really interesting to look at more with this. So um, we also had, uh, we did one more analysis where we, we overlaid the ISC. So these are the intact songs. And then in the background, we have the different song parts, like verses and choruses and instrumentals. And um, nothing definitive yet, but we're starting to see some evidence of the ISC becoming high when a song part is about to change. So you can see a pretty good peak here. Um, also, down here in the fourth song, there's a, there's a large peak. Um, so this might also be something that we can look at later. And if you think about the way that we consume music, um, especially music that is easy to grasp, uh, listeners can probably tell when the song part is about to change. And, and maybe that's something that, that draws us in as we listen to music. So to conclude from our first experiment, uh, we were happy to find that we can use this approach to study uh, music listening. And it seems that um, the stimuli that retain the basic features of music, so progression of events over time, things like beats and instruments, um, those are contributing to more reliable audience responses. And also, um, this notion of changes in material may drive ISC. And going back to the measure shuffle, maybe that's coming into play that there as well if you think of each measure kind of being a new song part or just novel information. So uh, we have a lot of questions coming out of the study too. So we use these engaging yet novel songs, but um, they're arguably not the most complex songs. So they're highly repetitive. They're fairly simple. Um, actually, a lot of our listeners reported that they didn't even know they were hearing a backward song. <laughs> They didn't know they were hearing a song that was cut up, and I think that kind of speaks um, to the, the base material that we were working off of. And, and we also want to know, you know, is this, is this just a pop song listening or a Hindi pop song listening phenomenon, or, or will this actually generalize to other musical styles? Um, and we're having some good success with our face scramble control so far, and so we would also like to know whether we can refine that control condition to start separating out other aspects of music, just from sound. So in our second experiment, um, we transitioned from pop music to classical music. And so for this one, we used um, a complete orchestral work. So this is an eight minute uh, movement from Elgar's Cello Concerto. Um, those of you who are familiar with this um, piece, uh, we're using kind of the canonical performance of the piece by Jacqueline Dupre. And um, we also impose a new control condition. So instead of just space scrambling the entire excerpt, we're also going to scale it back up to the amplitude envelope. So some people might ask, well, maybe you're just tracking changes in loudness. So now we can actually see whether changes in loudness are sufficient to drive engagement. And um, I'm not going to talk about the other responses here, but we actually recorded the EEG at the same time as we recorded people's heart rate and respiratory activity, so we have some physiology measures. And in a separate listen, the participant heard the stimuli again, and they used a slider to indicate how engaged they felt over time. So now we can look at what the brain is saying is a state of engagement versus what the listener report, reports as engaging musical material. So for our stimuli here, we have this, this eight-minute piece. Um, two versions, so at the top we have our original recording, and then down here we have our <coughs> face scrambled and scaled version of it. So just by inspection of the stimuli, I think we would all agree that these look fairly similar, right? So what could possibly go wrong? Um, <laughs> so, great. So, um, so let's just listen um, to one, one part of interest. So these markings here are, um, are annotations of musically significant events in the piece. 
So we're going to listen to um, kind of the entrance of the main cello theme as it builds up to the first structural high point of the piece. So here's the intact version. maybe having a physical reaction. Okay, so who thinks that the red one's gonna sound like that? <laughs> okay, let's listen um, to our control version. the entire piece and it had the same changes in loudness but probably you were not having the same experience <laughs> listening to that as you were to the first version so um, everybody heard both versions of these and so our results for this one um, were also kind of interesting so these are our most reliable components on the top we have the intact version and on the bottom we have our control version, and you can see that our intact version is producing that same component that we saw in the Hindi experiment, which was very encouraging. And additionally, um, our ISC over time was much higher for the intact version. So um, I think the measure shuffled in the Hindi was around 35% significant, and now we're over 60% significant. Um, for ISC over time. And in contrast, our control version is not even 4% significant. So it does appear that there is more to music listening than changes in amplitude over time, which is good. Um, and then uh, we can look at some other measures too. Like we can look at the correlation coefficient of the component itself. And in blue is our original. And you can see that, that it's much higher um, than the correlation that we could attain uh, using the responses to the phase scramble. We also collected behavioral ratings. So after you would hear each stimulus, you would, you would just give a numerical rating of how pleasant, arousing, interesting, predictable, and familiar each song was. And uh, one thing that I think is really interesting here is that actually um, the difference in perceived arousal for the two conditions um, was not statistically significant. So they weren't significantly different. So I think that's kind of giving us some insight into the fact that um, arousing does not equal engaging. So um, however, ratings of things like pleasantness and interestingness were significantly different. So I think this is kind of helping us refine our definition of engaging and also um, helping us to entangle, disentangle engagement um, from other constructs like arousal. So coming out of this experiment, um, we were happy to find that the ISC approach can generalize across genre. And in fact, um, the ISC for, for this excerpt was higher than our highest Hindi ISC. And um, I didn't talk about it too much in the previous slides, but there appears to be heightened engagement during the buildup to these structural high points, um, but less so when the high point happens. So maybe we can think about how that relates to the way that we anticipate um, important events in a musical piece. Um, and thanks to our new control, we can say that it's not just loudness that makes us engage with music. <laughs> so um, we have some future analyses planned for this. We have the physiological responses that we can also do ISC analysis on, um, as well as the continuous ratings of engagement. So um, now we're going to take a big turn away from these kind of Western tonal musical excerpts that we've been using till now. And, um, you know, so in, in Western tonal music, we have this framework that we can work in. So we have things like beats, meter, measures, and phrases. Um, when you think about 
musical expectations in this context, um, there are tonal events, so chord progressions lead to cadences, um, and you can use all of these cues um, to, as a listener, understand things like structural segmentation boundaries. But now we want to know whether um, the ISC approach can work with music that's still music but does not operate in this framework. And so now we're going to look at minimalist music. So this is a, a newer genre. And composers in the genre um, often look at changes in musical material over a much longer period of time. So your listening experience has to be, has to be different here. So um, this is an experiment that's being led by Tyson Dower, who's a PhD candidate in musicology in our group. And for this piece, he's looking at Piano Phase by Steve Reich. Has anyone heard this piece before? OK. So um, this piece is, this is the, the first part of the score, but it doesn't actually tell you how the piece sounds. So essentially, there's a simple musical pattern that you'll hear in just a moment. And it's being played by two performers. And one performer is playing the passage slightly faster than the other performer. So over time, the two voices will deviate, and then they'll line back up, but they'll be off by one note. So um, the score is just kind of showing the different alignments. And um, this piece has three motifs, and it takes about 20 minutes to go completely through the cycle of each motif. So uh, for this experiment, we actually have five different stimulus conditions. So we have the original, which um, does the phasing slowly over time from the original recording. And then we have one that is the abrupt change. So now you'll just have one alignment of the voices, and then it'll suddenly switch to the next alignment. So in terms of form, it's kind of the same, but you're missing that phasing aspect. Um, third, we have a segment shuffle, which is kind of this experiment's version of the measure shuffle, except we don't exactly have measures per se. So in this one, um, the piece has been partitioned into little windows and then shuffled. Um, there's actually an EDM remix of this piece. So we decided to, to use that as kind of um, our, our Western tonal easy to grasp control. And then finally, um, our version of the face scramble for this one is just to take all the notes of the motif, play them all at once over and over, and don't change it for five minutes. So, so now you'll get to hear examples of all of these. So here's an excerpt from the original, and just see if you can pick up on the fact that there are two performers who are playing um, slightly out of phase with each other. two voices and then they kind of came back together. Next is the abrupt change, so this will go from one alignment to the next. change to a new lineup of the voices and now the segment shuffle equivalent, so the musical material is changing, but you can't really predict what's going to happen next. And now, um, I know everyone's been waiting for the EDM version. What does EDM mean? Um, electronic dance music.
bunch of remixes of Steve Reich's work, so you can check that out. Um, and finally, um, the tremolo. <laughs> has no, no variation in time, right? So for this experiment, um, we are getting our preliminary results in. And um, first, our original version, we're getting about 13% significant ISC. So this is lower than, um, I would say, even the reverse version from the Hindi. Um, <laughs> it's OK. <laughs> um, next, um, our abrupt version is kind of performing around the same. And then third, our segment shuffle is actually producing slightly higher ISC over time. So this might be more engaging than listening to the original in some ways. Um, our remix is in first place with over 30% significant ISC. So this is actually um, fairly similar to what we were getting with the Hindi music. And then finally, our tremolo uh, comes in last with only 1% significant ISC. So, so we're starting to see, so I guess the first thing to say here is that minimalist music is processed differently from a tremolo control, but seems to be processed differently from this remix version, which is kind of what listeners might have an easier time grabbing onto first listen. And um, I think we also had only non-musician participants in this experiment, which, which might be one explanation for these results. And then I just want to point out as well that if you remember from our other experiments, we were getting this fairly consistent topography, um, which we also see in the remix for this experiment. But otherwise, um, if these are the true topographies, we're, we're getting slightly different topographies for the other conditions, which might implicate um, a different way of processing this kind of music. So um, the main findings from this experiment um, is that, as I said, minimalism is better than a tremolo control. Um, so, um, I'm sure the composers in this genre would appreciate that. Um, not as reliable um, as responses to the remix. And um, perhaps a different mechanism um, was engaged in the production of reliable responses here. And so, um, we're, we're just starting analysis on this, so it might be the case that the, the input um, to the reliable components analysis might not be the, the right way to look at the data. So um, one thing about minimalist music is it's thought to induce a state of listening um, in participants, and so um, there are other ways we can look at the response that are also linked more to um, different attentional states, and that might be something that is reliably evoked. Um, more than what we're seeing right now. And um, we also had our participants listen to each piece a second time and deliver the continuous behavioral rating of engagement. So we can look at that as well with this. Um, so just some generalizations from these first three studies. Um, it, it does appear that we can use the EEG ISD approach to study engagement with music. And one thing that I really, really like about this approach is that it lets us use real-world music. Um, a lot of music neuroscience research uses these highly controlled stimuli that are very distant from what we would choose to consume in real life. So um, it's great to have a way to actually study responses to music. And overall, it seems that there is this notion of organization of acoustical events in time, um, which is inherent to music that is really driving our engagement with music. And um, overall, we're, we are getting <coughs> consistent topographies, which is very encouraging, um, especially since we're trying to find an overall music processing component, with the exception of the minimalist music. Um, but that will also be interesting to study more in the future. Um, so that's, that's basically a snapshot of our, our music engagement research. Um, it's only one part of what the Music Engagement Research Initiative is working on as a group. So um, engagement in the brain is one part. Um, one thing that's really nice is that we can use the same data that we collect for the ISC studies to study other aspects of musical processing. So um, what Yasek was talking about at the end of his talk with the stimulus to response mappings, 
That's also something that we can study with our music data. Um, and there's a poster downstairs about that. And we're also collecting more data to look specifically at beat and tempo processing, um, finding some really interesting results with that so far. Uh, another track of our research has to do with large-scale industrial data. So this is a different kind of evidence of engagement. So we have um, a research agreement with Lyric Find who provides intact lyrics that we've been using to study things like musical influence as well as genre classification. And then um, we, we also have Shazam as an industrial collaborator of our group and we're doing some research with them, for instance, to see you know, when in a song do people want to discover it? And also um, looking at external factors like how is your music consumption different depending on the weather? And how does that show up through our discovery behavior? Our group has also um, has done and is doing um, research in learning and active engagement. So um, we had a line of research that was looking at um, piano teachers scores where they would indicate what kinds of errors young children make when they learn piano. And it turns out those errors are actually based in musical expectation. They're not just, you know, physical limitations, like there are actually reasons behind them. And um, looking in the movement side, thinking about um, how dance, which engages not only our auditory processing, but also visual and kinesthetic, um, how can you leverage um, those properties um, to tailor dance to autistic children based on their learning preferences. And underlying all of this, um, we have a number of research data sets that we're trying to release um, along with our, our studies. Um, so we have, these are kind of our three big ones and there will be more on the way. And um, we also have people working on, on research software to facilitate experiment design and also um, to do some brain decoding, which is another track of our group. So um, that's, the, that's the Music Engagement Research Initiative. And I guess I'll just close um, just to say, you know, we've had, I hope, an exciting collection of talks here today. So where can we go from here? So today we heard about objective measures of audience engagement, measuring engagement through the brain. We then talked about engaging key audiences. Um, for music creation, and then we experienced firsthand how our experience of music can be manipulated um, together with visual inputs, and then finally we saw some studies on quantifying musical engagement. So there are already some connections between these two talks, so the musical engagement studies were already drawing from the objective measures of audience engagement, and I think um, Arguably, a, a good direction to go next would be to try this active manipulation um, of the viewer or the listener um, and assess the impact on the brain response. And then coming from here, um, you know, part of having a successful AI for music creation, I think, is to have humans judge it as engaging. So <laughs> this could be a useful way um, to bring together these parts of the research. And I, I was gonna say, once the automatic music creation becomes sophisticated enough, you can manipulate people's experiences. But after hearing Doug's talk today, I think that's actually already well underway. Um, so that's the end of my talk for today. Um, I, I have to thank Jonathan Berger, who um, is the, the PI, the principal investigator of the group. Um, for helping this group come together and having a vision for the group when it started. Um, we have a number of generous funding sources that, that let us look into all of these different aspects of musical engagement. And um, I have to thank everybody who's in the group because this, this work is not something that can be done by one person. So, um, so that's all I have for today. And um, just a reminder to save the date for next year's symposium next May. Thank you.
And if he were, would you predict that he would be more engaged by his music or by the EDM version of his music? Oh, well, based on what I've, his writings that I've read, I would guess his own music, because <laughs> okay, he's he so not, I should ask it more directly. How much of this do you think is about um, habituation? And how much yeah. of this is about the actual musical structure? So that's one reason we did only have non-musicians participate <coughs> in this, this stage of the study, at least, was um, first they would be less likely to know the piece. Because I think once you understand what's going on in the piece, you attend to it in a different way than just having it thrown at you and like you're wearing electrodes and you don't know what's going on. So I, I think if you I think if you had like minimalism experts come in, then the results would be different. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, two points. Uh, first, uh, uh, I'm concerned about the length of the music. To listen to something, even Hindi music for four minutes, that's quite long. How does this length of music could affect the results? And, and second is, the minimalistic music you picked, if you had chosen a different kind of music, maybe a more sweet sounding, would the results be different? So for the first question, which is about the length of the songs, um, I think overall we were not seeing as much what was observed in the video studies with an overall decline in engagement over time. Um, so I mean, that, that's definitely something that we could look at in the data. Um, but I would say that the way that people consume music in real life is not even limited to hearing one song in its entirety. So I think, I think music is designed to be engaging over a long period of time. That would be my, my hypothesis with no data. And then um, to your second question, I, you know, I, I can't really comment on, I mean, even assigning a descriptor such as sweetness to minimalist music, um, I, I think would vary a lot from listener to listener. Um, so it, it's something we would have to study empirically, I think, in the future. Yeah. You mentioned uh, research about mapping. So is that like you have um, like a neural net to listen to the music and see if it can predict the EEG responses? Um, so it's it's actually um, the exact musical analogy as to what Yatsek was doing in his talk. So what we're doing so far is um, we're just using computationally extracted features from the audio, and then we're we're finding a maximal mapping between um, that feature and the corresponding brain response. But what you're suggesting would be very interesting for the future. Yeah. Yeah. A fascinating presentation, and uh, I really liked to work earlier when you talked with Shazam, not today, but your previous <laughs> post. But today, what, what my question is regarding EEG, and do you, do you think like like you can just ask a person uh, to uh, in real time give you feedback versus going this very complicated route to do this calculation and collect the data to like just a slider or something like you mentioned? And de determine all those factors: engagement, arousal, using some, uh, some, some, like, uh, yeah, some questions or I don't know, right? Um, so do you think people can just, you know, tell you how they're feeling in real time by doing some kind of manipulation? Yeah. Well, that's one reason we did collect that data because, um, as the Super Bowl commercial showed, um, the the response from the person whose brain data you're collecting. Um, behaviorally might act, not actually be an objective measure of their engagement at that time. And I think that's one reason why in the Super Bowl study... Um, what the, was that about? So that was um, viewing Super Bowl ads and the, the neural reliability of the experimental participants was extremely highly correlated with the large scale population measure, less so with the ratings of the people whose brain responses were collected. So that's kind of one reason why we're starting to look at both types of responses. And um, for the second experiment, we actually did a pilot version already and looked at the responses. And it seemed like people said they were engaged a lot when the music was loud. Um, but their 
engagement ratings were highly correlated when the music was building up to a high point. So I, I think there's already some interesting subtleties there. Yeah. Okay. One more question. Uh, what ages were these participants that you studied? Um, typically 18 to 35 years old. Yeah. So we we tried, especially for the first experiment, to match it to the demographic that would enjoy that. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Very last question. All right. Uh, uh, do they have um, educational experience in, the, um, in their knowledge of music, or like, do they know any of the persons that...? Um, so it varies by experiment. So for the Hindi experiment, we wanted to generalize to the just a population. So we didn't have any musical training uh, requirements. For Elgar, um, they did have to have musical training, and they could not play the cello, because that could be another confound. For Tyson's experiment, we had non-musicians. Um, and then we have another experiment that I, I didn't talk about today where you actually have to have musical training and music theory training um, because we were looking at, at something related to tonal processing. So it, it kind of varies depending on the goal of the experiment. Yeah. Um, OK, so this concludes the talks portion of the symposium. And we have lunch um, one floor down on the back lawn. So I hope you'll go and get some lunch and then come back in also one floor down. Same level as the lunch. And we have a poster session going on in the classroom, which is directly downstairs from here. So thank you.